So this is lesson or sermon number two. And um, Paul had written a letter to the church of Philippi. First time the gospel was preached in Europe. And uh, he talks about his journey and, and the things he encountered on three different missionary journeys. And uh, it was a challenging time for Christianity as the Spirit of God descended upon the day of Pentecost and the church was at that time initiated and Paul had the commission from God to take the gospel not only to the Jews but to the Gentiles. And um, he endured a number of difficult situations on these three different missionary journeys and he concluded by being in prison in Rome and then his life was taken around 64 AD. When he wrote to the church of Philippi, he made mentions of four different things that he still desired in spite of all the revelation and all the encounters that he had with God and serving the Lord. In Philippians chapter 3, just in verses 10 through 11, he mentioned four significant things that he desired of the Lord after all that he knew and encountered he still had this tremendous yearning within his heart and mind. He says this, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. And as I read in the scriptures about the life of Paul, I believe that he fulfilled that and accomplished that in his life. Yet still, he said, even though of all the revelations that I've received and all the epistles that I've written and all the things the Lord has communicated unto me, I still have desire to know more of Christ. And I think that's going to be something that we're going to encounter when we step into eternity in the presence of the Lord. There's no end to God. He is the Alpha and the Omega. And I think we'll ever be growing and learning of what God has prepared for us. In the letter to the church of Corinth, he says, I has not seen nor ears heard nor has entered the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who truly love him. Amen. And he says in the letter to the Romans, he says that those who love God and are called according to his purpose, he says, all things work together for good in their lives. Amen? Now, you and I have had a lot of difficulties in trials and tribulation. No one goes through this life unscathed. And the thing that we have going for us because our relationship with the Lord, that we know whatever is going on, that we can grab a hold of him. He's our anchor, and that we can move forth in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's interesting that... Um, Paul said something that probably a lot of people don't want to even maybe consider or recognize is he says, I sound like a madman. This is another translation of the scriptures of verse 10 and 11 of the third chapter of Philippians. Because I've worked hard, been in prison, been whipped, and faced death time and time again. Now, you might think some people say, you know, I want to serve God. I want to uh, be faithful unto the Lord. And you see Jesus making this understanding to his disciples and even Paul reiterating it. If you're going to be truly a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you live a godly life, you will suffer. And that's something that we don't want to get up and say, well, I want to volunteer, Lord. I'm here today. You know, I, I want to uh, share in your sufferings. I don't think anyone in their right mind would want to volunteer to do that. But if we're going to truly be a servant of the Lord, there's a strong possibility that, that might happen. I think here that we need not to stick our head in the sand as we continue to move forth here even in the United States. 
that if we're going to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ here in America, because of all the things that have happened, the woke ideology, increase in, in agnosticism, atheism, and what's transpiring in our culture, because there is, unfortunately, in America, the di- a decline in Christianity, that a true follower of Jesus Christ will more likely suffer persecution. And sometimes it will come right from your own family, maybe not your immediate family, maybe your extended family or people you know. And so a wise person doesn't put their head in the sand and just suffer the consequences. What we prepare ourselves spiritually, Lord, I ask that you would grace me if that would begin to happen in my lifetime, that I would not renounce you, that I would not back away from loving people and sharing the gospel, that I would be true to you and be a faithful follower. And you see, Paul here is making mention of that. He says, I am willing to pay whatever price. All those things I thought were so important to me, he said here, previously to this verse here, beginning in verse 10, he says, all those accolades and my education and my the fact that from the tribe of Benjamin and that I was a Pharisee and I was diligent in serving God based upon my understanding of Judaism. He says, I count that as dung compared to knowing Jesus Christ. For me to live as Christ and die is gain, he says. Either way, I'm going to win. So he wasn't intimidated by the devil. He wasn't intimidated by mankind and He was faithful and committed to the Lord. So we can look at the writings of Paul on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, I ask that you work your grace, you work in my life, Lord, that I'm willing to do whatever you call me to do to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Interesting, when you look at the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 11, Beginning in verse 23, Paul mentions the things that he encountered in serving the Lord. A lot of times people say, well, I'd just be glad to be an apostle or a prophet or pastor or teacher evangelist, a missionary. But Paul says here, here's what I endured and here's what I have encountered beginning in chapter 11, verse 23. Now listen to this. He says, are they servants of Christ? He says, I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Just think about that. Being tied to a post and someone taking a whip, not just a few times, but 40 times. That would probably end most of our lives if something happened to that, that if that happened to us. Three times I've been beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at the sea, in danger from the false brothers. I have been labored and toiled, and I have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst have been often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak? And I do not feel weak. Who is led in sin? And I do not inwardly burn concerning all these things. Think about that. I I wonder if I had been in that position if what I endured, would you have endured? And undergone all those trials and tribulations, would I continually 
continually, faithfully serve the Lord, do what God has called me to do. The only way I think Paul could do this, the only way if you and I were caught in that place and position is that God would grace us, meaning give us the power to endure and not waver in our commitment, not turn away, not shrink away, not throw in the towel, not give up. And I'm just amazed by all that transpired in his life. And then here, when he writes this letter to the church of Philippi, he says, I still want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection and to fellowship in his sufferings be made conformable unto death and know for sure that I will receive resurrection life from the Lord Jesus. God gives us that blessing and promise. I, you know, I, I think sometimes we in America think we're isolated from having to contend with such things. When you look at what's going on in the world today, there are Christians today who are being persecuted and suffering for taking a stand for Christ. One organization that we faithfully submit and support, and not we submit, but we support on a monthly basis as Voice of the Martyrs. And each month they put out a magazine, update what's transpiring in different countries. There are 50 countries in the world today where Christians are suffering, where Christians are undergoing and even being martyred for their faith. Interesting, I looked this up. The top 10 countries where Christians suffer the worst per persecution, first and number one, is North Korea. Interesting, in that country, if you are a Christian, if you violate their laws, not only are you in prison, but your whole entire family is thrown in jail. And most people who are do not survive in North Korea. That is one country that's isolated and closed off to the world. The second country is Afghanistan. You saw what happened when the U.S. backed out of Afghanistan and then the people who were in power at that time, the Taliban took over. And instead of moving forward, they took the people back, you might say, to the Middle Ages and adhering to strict Muslim laws. And where women had freedom in going to school and, and, and doing things, advancing that nation, they've gone backwards and now are being severely persecuted. If you're a Christian, you're a target. And the next country is Somalia, Sudan, Pakistan, Eritrea, Libya, Iraq, Yemen, and Iran. Someone told me recently, and I don't have anything to back this up, but what I heard from some other pastors, that one place where there is a move of God and where the gospel is making a tremendous impact is in the nation of Iran. I would have thought maybe China or some other Asian country, but it was Iran. And people are coming to Christ and what's happening, people are having visions and dreams, and God is encountering people and revealing himself to them, and they're coming to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. Amen? Now, interesting that a lot of times we think, well, these things are happening a long ways from here. We are isolated from that. I don't know anyone here in the United States who's been beaten with a rod. I don't know anyone for their faith. I don't know anyone in the United States who's been whipped 40 times or stoned. Anyone, I don't know anyone here that's happened to that in the United States. But I had a dear friend, and I mentioned this before, and this is not new to you, but some people it will be, that a dear friend of mine, I first visited in 2005 in Haiti, John Paul, 
who had dual citizenship and not only in Haiti but the United States, God dealt with him in a very clear and poignant way while he was living here in the United States, said, I had commissioned you when you were a young boy that you would return to Haiti and serve me there and take the gospel to that whole nation. So he did that. Sold everything he had, left his family and his children here, went back to his home nation, his hometown in Port-au-Prince, and started a ministry, and it exploded. Prior to his death, he was discipling 417 men and covered the whole nation of Haiti. And I met with him two months before his return, I think it was 2019, to Haiti. And we had planned to do some things and to uh, visit there and do some outreaches. And so he was serving there in Haiti. And he had just had a Bible study and was headed back to his house. His nephew was in his car riding with him, unbeknownst to him. This was not a random act. He was targeted. Someone had been watching him. In fact, that day he took a different route in going back from where he was teaching at the Bible school back to his home. He came to an intersection. He stopped, and a young man on a motorcycle came up to him right there next to the driver's side as one that was down and drew out a pistol and executed John Paul. He still survived enough to try to protect his nephew and drove a short distance to safety and then the automobile, his car came to a conclusion and he expired. John Paul was a man who was committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. I attended his funeral in 2019 at Midway Presbyterian Church. And he knew that he was targeted. He had, prior to this, he had been attacked by three other ministers who weren't really preachers of the gospel. They were charlatans and beat and told him to stop preaching the gospel because what was happening, people were leaving their churches coming to his church because he was preaching the truth and lives were being changed and transformed. He was not intimidated by that. He, was not, he wasn't going to give up and stop because of what had happened. And things like that happened numerous times. When he came to the city where he was ministering the gospel and started that work and grew a huge church and started several other churches an orphanage, and a number of other ministries. There were, I think, a dozen witch doctors who were practicing in that area. He did not particularly attack them, but just begin to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. As a result, they lost their influence, and the power of God removed those witch doctors. It could have been one of them who hired an assassin to take the life of John Paul. No one will ever know. There's not a system of law and order, unfortunately, in Haiti at that time, even now. But he paid the ultimate price. And the thing was, that was the first person I knew who had paid that price for taking a stand for righteousness. Jesus said this, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to follow me, he says, it will cost you everything, even maybe your life. We have to ask ourselves the question, is Jesus worth it? Amen? Is he worth it? It says in Matthew chapter 10, I think it's verse 28, the servant is not greater than the master. The disciple is not greater than than the Lord. And if Jesus sets the example and he came and 
gave his life that we might have eternal life. And if we're going to follow Jesus, it says in 2 Timothy 3, 12, if you live a godly life, you will suffer persecution. It's not that we want to go out there and volunteer for that, but if we do the right thing, that's a strong possibility that that might begin to happen in our life in this day and time that we live. I've talked with other pastors, and they're convinced that that's what's going to begin to happen in America because you see all the things that are happening. And because we live a life based on a biblical worldview and we order our lives according to Scripture, there are a lot of things happening in our culture that are in opposition to what God's Word says in the family, in the institution of marriage, in determining who's a male, who's a female. We know that we're created in the image of God. And the list goes on and on. So I'm not surprised what's transpiring in the world. It may begin to even visit here in the United States. Now, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm being realistic. Can you say amen? There was a young man. He had a wife and three children. I met him back in 2015 on the internet and developed a relationship with this guy named Burvis. He lived in the Philippines. We got to know him and communicated with him. And he lived in a, an area that was dominated by Muslims. But he wanted to win them to the saving grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was a poor part of that nation. And he, we got several pictures that he sent illustrating what was taking place and transpiring. And one thing we did several years ago, we bought a motorcycle and actually a trail bike and presented it to him because where he was going, he couldn't get there if you drive an automobile or some other vehicle, but that motorbike could go a lot of places where you couldn't go with any other means of transportation. I think we paid $1,500 for that. Not only that, but we supported him. I remember he sent me a message that his wife was having her baby was in the hospital, and he couldn't get her out of the hospital until he came up with the money to pay for all her medical expenses. The cost was $500. And we were able to get that, wire that money to him, so he got his wife and child out of that hospital. In 2017, on June the 6th, I got some correspondence from him. Dear Pastor Larry, thanks for your concern about asking about Islamic terrorism here. Yes, we really need your prayers for our safety and protection this time because we live in Mandanao area in the Philippines and our president declared a martial law here in our area because according to the news, we hear that here in Mindanao area, there are a lot of ISIS scattered and their goal is to destroy and kill the Christian. And I see in the news that there are some Christians now who are killed, and I think this is a religious war for them. Our life here is in danger, but I always believe that as a Christian, we have a special protection from our God, and I know God is always there to take care of us. Sometimes it is uncomfortable for me, the situation especially you see the news that there are some Christians that are killed and to know that they are in some parts in our area still at war, but we trust and believe to God every day. Now, his English maybe is not as good as ours, but he's doing a pretty good job. <laughs> Thanks also for your prayers of provision of our ministry here, and we believe God will use us and our prayers and needs, I'm thankful that God will bless us and provide our need here in the ministry. He is really our faithful partner and supporter in our ministry. 
And you know that there is a time that I feel we are all alone in our ministry. But when I remember and meditate on how the Lord provides our needs, I am so encouraged more to continue doing our ministry by faith. Thanks a lot again for always being there and praying for our ministry. Shalom, Burvis, and family. That was the last time I heard from him. Several times I tried to contact him. I even went on a map of the Philippines and found that place and wrote letters to other places there in that area, in that community. Some other churches I found that were there and trying to find out what happened to Burvis and his family. Sent him several emails. Never heard again from Burvis. I don't know what happened to him. Maybe his life was taken. Not only his life, but his entire family. And so, I begin to realize, I see what happened to my dear friend John Paul in 2019, Burvis in 2017. So it really hits home because when I was growing up, we heard about things happening in Ecuador with James Elliott and different people who've gone to far outlying places. But all of a sudden, I begin to realize this is real close and near when you know these people, where you, like with John Paul, had close fellowship with him, been to Haiti several times. He's been here at our church. And then all of a sudden, one day, boom, he's gone. The amazing thing, neither one of these men never wavered in their faith. And then I read here what Paul says. He says, I want to know Christ. I am willing to share in the sufferings of Christ, even be made conformable unto his death. And then I, I think, what if I was in that place? What if you were in that place of position? And you were under attack by the adversary. We were not against flesh and blood. We were against principalities and powers. A lot of the things that people do, such as these ISIS terrorists and different ones, according to their understanding and their religion, they think they're doing the right thing of being faithful. Paul, before he had that encounter on the road to Damascus, he was sincere about serving God through Judaism and dealing with these revolutionaries called the way, Christians. And they convinced that they got the truth and doing the right thing. And don't realize how the enemy will capture a heart and mind through a false religion or ideology, convince people that they are doing the right thing and serving their God. And Christianity doesn't evangelize by using the sword. We evangelize to the love of God, even to the point where it might cost us our life and we become a martyr. I pray to God if that should begin to happen here in the next few years where they'll say, okay, prayer and praise, you need to tone down your rhetoric. You need to move away from having a biblical worldview and living your life according to the word of God. You, you need to stop saying that Traditional marriage is based on the fact it's a union of a man and woman. You, you need to stop talking about a man and a woman being created in the image and likeness of God. That you need to understand that people need to have the freedom to do what they want in spite of what the Word of God says. And if you continue to preach the gospel and tell people they're sinners, they need to repent, need to confess. You need to stop saying that and you need to tone things down because you're espousing hate and causing division. And if you don't stop, we're going to take your 501c3 away from you. And people can't use their donations 
as a tax exemption. You know what I would say to them? Take it. We're not going to be intimidated by that. We don't give because we want a tax write-off. God forbid you give because you love the Lord. Amen? You worship God in your tithes and offerings. Amen? And one thing we're not going to do is and we're not going to stop telling people that God is the one who initiates salvation. God is the one who has the power to bring salvation in the heart and life. People are born again by the Spirit of God. And then the person has to respond by faith, repenting, confessing, and believing, and surrendering their life to the Lord Jesus Christ as the Holy Spirit moves and interacts in their life and stirs them and calls them to come to him because he chose them before the foundation of the earth that we are the elect of God. Can you say amen? God, give us the strength and grace that we would not throw in the towel or give up. Amen? That when we go out into the public arena, if it's at Walmart or if we go to McDonald's or El Ranchero, <laughs> And we wouldn't get food poisoning. I mean, now we wouldn't have any problems. <laughs> you know, no. We wouldn't be intimidated by that. But that we would begin to bless people and love them, even if they speak against us, persecute us, even if they say things to us that are ungodly, that we would stand for the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and not be intimidated. There's a scripture in Hebrews chapter 13 how we pray for people that we know who might be missionaries in Afghanistan or Somalia or Iran or any one of those countries that we mentioned and here's what the word of God says that we should do and pray for the our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted in those 50 nations that we see where this is happening. Here's what Hebrew says, chapter 13, verse 3. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. So we need to pray for our brothers and sisters who are maybe in Haiti or the Philippines or Somalia or Sudan or North Korea, even though we don't know them. But he says, you need to identify with them as if you were there with them, praying for them, that God would strengthen them and help them. Here's what the voice of the martyrs says about many of the people that they're in contact, contact with were being persecuted. They don't pray and ask, God, get me out of jail, get me out of prison, get me out of this predicament. What they say, Lord, help me that I will stand strong in the faith and not renounce Jesus as my Lord and Savior. God, use me if I'm in prison, if I'm being persecuted, if I'm being slandered. Use me, Lord God, to be a light in darkness. Use me, Lord God, to be able to speak the gospel and see these people who are persecuting me to come to the saving grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. You see, I think suffering from the Lord is a mighty weapon in the hand of the believer to be used of God to do something that we can't do, but only through the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen? Now, we might not see our life taken in these days that we live in, but there are still people here. There's probably 260,000 people in Cherokee County. And a majority of the people in Cherokee County do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. From what I hear Maybe only 10% of the people in this county are actively involved 
in the church every Sunday. And there is an adversary who has come to kill, steal, and destroy. And God has given us to be his messenger, his ambassadors, his emissaries, to not go out there and coerce people or try to use all our skill in convincing them that they need to turn their heart and life over to Jesus. What we need to do is look for the leadership and direction of the Holy Spirit because he's the one who convicts. He's the one who saves. He's the one who causes people to be stirred in their heart and mind. And then when we see God at work, we need to join the Holy Spirit and speak the truth in their lives and not be fearful and intimidated. Gilda is a blessing to me. I've said this, I picked on her before. She's not afraid. She'll be at Walmart or McDonald's or El Ranchero and she'll tell them, you either turn or burn. And she might not use that cliche, but she's not intimidated. And, and, and people... I tell you, probably because her age and that beautiful hair of hers, they said, I better listen to this lady because she's got a cane in her hand. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I say that just, but, you know, we need not to try to make a door open. We need to see where the door is open, and then we need to walk through that door. And it's becoming more difficult. I've been told at different public venues, not to pray in the name of Jesus. When people tell me that, what I do? Pray in the name of Jesus. Amen? And when people say to you, don't take, just stay within the four walls of your church, that's an opportunity for me to say, no, I'm not going to stay in the four walls of my church. And so we need to realize one clear thing, and I already mentioned this one time, that if we're going to live a godly life, well, hopefully we're doing that, that each day that we spend time with the Lord, that spiritually we will fill our tanks with the unction of the Holy Ghost and yield and submit to the Lord and let him use us to live for the Lord and be salt and light and speak the truth in people's lives. Can you say amen? The best place to start is with your family, your extended family. How many people here, talking about your family, extended family, you know people within that context who, knew, who need Jesus as Lord and Savior? Raise your hand. All of us. I mean, there's, there's people. And, and my prayer is that when I step in eternity, that I will see my entire family, not one will be lost, but all come to the saving grace and knowledge of Jesus. That's our family. Amen? I know you, we cannot go out there and put a knife to their throat or a gun to their head and say, you will call on the name of Jesus right now because you're going to meet him soon. We don't do it that way. But the power of prayer and getting on our face, that we line up and hear the voice of God as we pray that he will direct us and that the Spirit of God will begin to deal with hearts and lives and we'll see people changed and transformed by the power of the Holy Ghost within our own family. Can you say amen? Please stand.